Good day, everyone, and welcome to the supplemental virtual mini conference call hosted by Scott Hartshaw. My name is Leslie, and I'm the event manager. During the presentation, your lines will remain on listen only, and if you require assistance at any time, please keep star zero on your telephone, and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. You may submit web questions throughout the presentation by clicking on the Q&A tab, and that's on the front of your screen with a black circle and the three white dots. If you click in there, you should submit your question, and then please send to all panelists, and then they will be addressed in the Q&A session. I'd like to advise all parties that the conference is being recorded for replay purposes, and now I'd like to hand you over to your host for today, Scott. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and welcome everyone. This is Scott Hartzell, your host, and we have a special presentation in our webinar series today. Owing to the fact that the uh, coronavirus has caused cancellation of a number of venues for presentations and technical uh, webinars like this, we stepped in the gap to uh, offer to you a, a short conference here. We have four of our subject matter experts at Parsons who are prepared to uh, give you a short talk on their area of expertise. And so what we will do is we will have a, uh, a presentation and then we'll have a short Q&A session and then another presentation and a Q&A after each one of the four presentations. So if you have a question, uh, go ahead and send it in on the chat feature or on the Q&A feature within WebEx and we will get to those questions at the end of each presentation. So with that, I would like to introduce to you our uh, market leader for the environmental group at Parsons, Pratima Poplai, and she's going to give a little welcome here. Pratima, it's up. All right, thank you, Scott, and welcome, everyone. We're really thrilled that you can join us today. In a few minutes, as Scott mentioned, four of our technical and technology leaders will present on problems, solutions, and ideas impacting our world and industry today. But before we get to our presenters, I want to share why our team is hosting a virtual mini-conference, a reason which many of you may relate to. When we started 2020, several of our subject matter experts and technical leaders were scheduled and very excited to present at numerous conferences. As each conference got canceled or postponed, and we all resolved to work remotely, it became evident that our need to connect, collaborate, share ideas, and find solutions was even greater than ever before. So with that objective in mind, we decided to supplement our regularly scheduled monthly webinar series with this mini conference. While we're safely together in a virtual room, our SMEs will present some of the same topics they planned on presenting at conferences this year. Thank you to the team who planned this event for being agile and adaptive in continuing to achieve our goal of why we present and attend uh, conferences in a creative new way. Also, a big thank you to our four presenters, Jeff Hale, Eric Maisona, Joab Rappaport, and Glenn Ulrich, for sharing your knowledge with our audience on a wide array of critical topics ranging from responding in the current pandemic to incorporating technology in our day-to-day -day business to utilizing enhanced bioremediation methods and to maximize the cost benefits for site remediation. As always, we start each webinar with a Parsons core value, and we have six of them, safety, quality, integrity, diversity, innovation, and sustainability. However, I'm unable to choose just one for today's event because during the current pandemic circumstances, I was and still am urgently reminded of the importance of our core values in shaping our culture and who we are. Each of the six is independently important and interconnected in our mission to deliver a safer, healthier, and a better world. So as I get ready to introduce our first speaker, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for attending and wish you, your family, your team, the very best of health. Please stay safe, be well, and be assured that 
even, we are even more focused on finding solutions for our customers and communities, and we are prepared to safely deliver those solutions with people, process, and technology in our new and transformed work environment. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Jeff Hale is our Director of Emerging Environmental Issues. Jeff is focused on the management, mitigation, and remediation of emerging contaminants for our private, state, and federal customers in North America and in Australia. Jeff is based in Pennsylvania, very passionate about environmental solutions. He's a big Penn State fan and loves ice hockey. So take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Pratima. <clears throat> so I will be uh, presenting on the pandemic we're experiencing today. Um, so the title is Confronting the Threat of the SARS-CoV-2 in Future Virus Outbreaks as Environmental Contaminants. So I'd like to start out by saying that um, I'm not a public health professional. I'm an environmental scientist, and I've been looking, uh, in Parsons has been looking at the COVID pandemic through that perspective, uh, looking at this, looking at data patterns and trends, you know, from an environmental perspective. Uh, we're looking to uh, endure the crisis, help our communities and clients endure the crisis, but beyond that, we're looking to make the world a better place um, on the back end of it. So I would also like to say that um, this is a serious and a solemn subject. Some of the data I'll be presenting include mortality data, um, but I want to be clear that we don't regard the victims just as statistics, but we recognize they were people and loved ones. So my agenda today will uh, cover two main topics. Putting the pandemic in perspective, uh, any time we confront a new challenge, a new situation, a uh, new contaminant or you know, uncertain landscape, I really like to ground the situation uh, relative to what we know and what we don't know. So I'll be talking about the history and frequency of outbreaks and pandemics. I'll make a comparison to the 1918 flu pandemic and we'll dive a little deeper and look at a few specific urban case studies from 1918 versus 2020. And then the second half, I'll talk about Parsons' COVID-19 response and our three-pronged approach to safe work practices, disinfection services, and detection and surveillance of virus and other, uh, other biological hazards. So putting the per pandemic in perspective. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so Looking at the information available through the World Health Organization, there are dozens of outbreaks of viruses and bacteria every month and every year. Um, so we shouldn't have a false sense of security and we should recognize that this threat is ever present. Uh, we shouldn't feel that it wouldn't or doesn't happen where we live. As we've learned recently, um, these uh, these outbreaks act globally when we let our guard down. Um, pandemics are not new. There have been 10 influenza pandemics since 1729, and, the most, and most recently in 2009. Um, interesting fact is that the 2009 H1N1 flu virus still circulates seasonally. Um, uh, another interesting point to note, uh, and this is this point is made by the University of Minnesota Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, that uh, flu pandemics occur randomly. Um, we're never due for a pandemic because we haven't had one in a while, and we're no safer just following one. This is what they call gambler's fallacy, uh, to think that you know your something's due. So statistically, the timing of a pandemic just happens randomly. And you can see that on the timeline on the right. So for instance, in 1729, uh, there was a flu pandemic. Shortly thereafter, in 1732, there was also a flu pandemic. You look at the 1800s, similar situation, 1830, 1833, there was a flu pandemic, but the next one didn't occur until 1829. So that's 
what statistics tells us. History tells us by looking at this timeline that we can probably count on three flu, flu pandemics uh, per century. Um, there have been three novel coronavirus outbreaks in the 2000s, the SARS-CoV, the MERS-CoV, and the current SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. And you know, one thing that is different is the current pandemic, it's not a flu virus, but it is a coronavirus. So the takeaway here is uh, we're at increased risk when vaccination, detection, hygiene, and disinfection are lacking. And I would add um, monitoring and surveillance to that as well. So sticking with a the comparative theme, let's take a closer look at the 1918 flu pandemic, which you probably heard a lot about, and compare it to the, the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so some similarities and differences here. Um, the, so the 1918 flu pandemic was an H1N1 virus of bird origin, and we're dealing today we're dealing with the coronavirus of bat origin. There were about 500 million people infected with the flu in 1918. That was 28 percent of the world's population at the time, which was about 1.7 billion people. And compared to today, where we have a little over uh, three and a quarter million people infected, um, which is about only 0.04 percent of the world's population. And the graph on the right-hand side helps illustrate that. So in 1918, not surprisingly, the population was much smaller, but uh, both in relative and absolute terms, many more people infected. Today we have a much larger population, and again in absolute and relative terms, fewer people impacted. I'm sure you've heard that um, people in the age group of 65 years or older um, are particularly sensitive to the current coronavirus. Um, and we compare that to the 1918 flu pandemic, which is pretty interesting. Uh, people less than five years of age were particularly susceptible to that flu. That's not especially surprising. Those people hadn't really developed their immune system yet, and people 65 years and older uh, may have had compromised immune systems due to age. But was really, one thing that was really interesting is uh, um, in 1918, the age group of 20 to 40 year olds was also particularly su uh, susceptible. No one really knows why um, to this day, but that was an interesting facet. Uh, whether it was in 1918 or today, there's no vaccine. Uh, there were no antibiotics in 1918. Uh, that's relevant because um, of secondary infections, bacterial infections that would have set in due to the virus itself. Uh, obviously today we have a, a, a suite of antibiotics at our disposal and more advanced technology. Um, generally speaking, the 1918 flu pandemic lasted about 24 weeks um, before it was you know, just particularly flat with new cases and uh, you know, we're not even near that far into the current pandemic. So next, please. Uh, so let's look at a couple specific examples. You may have heard about uh, how St. Louis, Missouri in 1918 was sort of the model for flattening the curve uh, based on early and aggressive social distancing. So this is the actual mortality data from St. Louis. Um, the, this information comes from a recent National Geographic article called How Some Cities Flattened the Curve During the 1918 Flu Pandemic. And I basically uh, transferred that data into this format. And one thing we should notice is that when social distancing occurred. So it did happen early and it was fairly aggressive in St. Louis and they did manage to quote flatten the curve, suppress it and basically push out uh, the number of instances they had. Uh, you'll notice there's a hiatus in, uh, in the graph here where they, they let off and they eased up on the social distancing and that resulted in a rebound or spike. And that's one thing everyone is really concerned about right now. When you look at any other urban area from 1918, most of them had this double dip effect where there was a rebound uh, after they got over the initial hump. In St. Louis, St. Louis was really the only city where the second peak was higher, but overall they did reduce the number of cases. 
So in summary, looking at the St. Louis data you may have heard much about, um, they flattened the curve, they delayed the peak, there was a definite rebound after a hiatus in social distancing. The, the peak had, I'm sorry, the pandemic had a long tail though. You know, the green in this graph indicates like the bottom third, uh, you know, of the cases, the amount of cases, but you still had, you know, 10 cases per 100,000 people going out for 24 weeks. So in a major urban area, that might be 100 deaths per week way after um, the peak. Um, and so in this case, it was a 24 plus week duration. So in comparison, let's look at uh, recent data for the 2020 COVID-19 uh, pandemic. This data is from Nassau County, New York. So Nassau County is the first county uh, in Long Island, east of New York City. I chose this data um, is instead of data from New York City itself because it was substantial, but it the data were a lot smoother with the ramp up. If you look at the New York City data, um, it just, you know, it just shot up abruptly. So it wasn't a very good statistical curve. This data comes from the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus uh, Online Resource Center. May, many of you may have seen it. It's a great resource. So to put uh, these data into date perspective, March 5th was the first case detected in Nassau County. April 27th was the day I prepared this graph, and August 17th would correspond to 24 weeks out. And next, please. So the question remains, what we're all concerned about is what happens next, what happens through the next several months. Um, you know, looking at the St. Louis data that we just looked at, um, this could tail on for a while, and there could be a peak, another peak within there. So looking at Nassau County, uh, the initial peak has been surmounted. Uh, the magnitude itself is comparable to St. Louis, Missouri in 1918, about 50 to 60 uh, deaths per 100,000 um, people. Um, and I just want to reiterate, as I did in the opening, uh, you know, we look at these data very solemnly. You know, these aren't statistics, these are people. Um, and so there could still be the potential for rebound and the tailing duration is unknown. So these are the things we're bearing in mind as a company, uh, both to endure the crisis, but also to, you know, contribute to the solution. Next, please. So hopefully that gives you some context on uh, the current pandemic, how it compares to you know, ever-present threats of viruses and bacteria and some historical perspective. So now I'll be talking briefly about Parsons' COVID-19 response. So pandemic or no pandemic, our mission, and I think Pratima led off with this, is to make the world safer, healthier, and more connected. Uh, that objective is somewhat at odds with itself right now, but I think we can accomplish all three. Um, our specific objectives through this pandemic are twofold. One is risk reduction and elimination in the tailing rebound phase that we just talked about. And then we want to contribute enduring practices and technologies for a safer tomorrow. So beyond 24 weeks, years from now. Um, we've got a three-pronged approach with three specific uh, focus areas. That is safe work practices and project continuity plans, um, disinfection, particularly disinfection as a service for critical care decontamination systems, and then uh, de detection and surveillance. Um, to get us through the, you know, the next dangerous phase, but to leave a lasting technology. So safe work practices and project continuity plans. We are adopting CDC guidance. We're combining that with our knowledge and training and uh, health and safety, as well as our health and safety equipment to come up with safe work practices and project continuity plans, both in the field and in the office. So in the field, um, project continuity enhanced safety plans have been prepared for all projects with field elements. Uh, these include daily health questionnaires, social distancing on field teams, 
health-based stop work protocols, enhanced tool and workplace decon procedures, masks and PPE in use where it can be applied, uh, and we're producing our own masks through our 3D printing capabilities as well. Um, Office-based project elements include equipment and remote operations, software upgrades, and increased work-life flexibility. So now we'll look at um, critical disinfection service. Um, you may, I'm sure you've heard of the N95 mask by now. It's become iconic and it's a critical piece of personal protective equipment in the fight against the coronavirus. Um, the National Institutes of Health has validated four disinfection methods for these masks so they can be reused. So these methods include vaporized hydrogen peroxide, a 70 degree Celsius dry heat application, ultraviolet light application, or 70% ethanol spray. Um, Battelle has developed a critical care decontamination system that uses hydrogen peroxide mist to disinfect the N95 masks and other PPE. These units can disinfect up to 80,000 masks per day and can be reused up to 20 times. And the critical care decontamination system uh, is to be operated throughout the U.S. And I'm proud to say Parsons has been selected to operate uh, the CCDS uh, decontamination systems uh, to, you know, in the fight against the coronavirus. So that's a contribution we're proud to make. And this takes us to our third prong of our third prong approach, and that's detection and surveillance. So I think this is going to be very important in this tailing phase of the virus, which I think we're all going to have to start taking on more risk as we get back to work and get back to our lives, but the threat still lingers. So this quote on the left-hand side was very prophetic. Um, so Dr. Jennifer Rakeman, who's the Assistant Commissioner of the New York City Department of Public Health, said in October of 2019, not, uh, not too long before um, the pandemic emerged, a biological attack or large-scale infectious disease outbreak in New York City would significantly impact the health, security, economy, and political stability, not only of the city, but of the rest of the country, and will have an international impact. Sounds very familiar. We've been living that just a few months after this statement was made. One way to deal with this situation now and forever um, is through next generation digital biosensing technology that will revolutionize monitoring and surveillance of contagious and malicious biohazards. Um, this technology is, exists in certain forms is in, and is in the process of being developed further. Um, this technology is capable of detecting viruses and bacteria with sensitivity and specificity uh, they're superior to reagent methods, um, such as molecular diagnostic methods that are not digital, um, generate waste, et cetera. Um, this next generation biosensing technology can be equipped with microelectronics that can be digitally integrated into a network of sensor systems and linked to digital databases and GIS systems. Just think of the power of that, not only being able to detect um, a virus that is present rapidly, but also being able to link it to a database and a GIS system almost instantly. Um, use cases for this type of technology include human testing, wastewater surface surfaces, ambient and filtered air. And Parsons is a thought leader, technology integrator, and investor in this next generation biosensing technology. So that will take me to the conclusions. Um, the threat of outbreaks and pandemics is not new. It's an ever-present risk. Um, potential for rebound and lingering cases of COVID-19 are anticipated longer than the, quote, lockdown can be sustained. Implementation of safe work practices will be critical during the tailing and potential rebound phase. Continued social distancing, PPE use, hygienic habits, and disinfection will remain important. And enhanced detection, monitoring, and surveillance is anticipated to be in place in time for the tailing phase, but also as an enduring technology um, to prevent and alleviate this type of situation in the future. So um, that brings me to the conclusion of my presentation. 
I think we have time for a couple of questions, and if Leslie, our moderator, could restate uh, how to submit a question, that would be great. Yes, certainly. Thank you, everyone. Your question and answer session will now begin. If you wish to ask a question on the WebEx, please just click on the black circle with the three white dots, type your question, and then send to all panelists. Thank you. So I think the first uh, introductions and presentation went a few minutes long, perhaps. Um, we actually should be moving on to the next one. So I will, would like to introduce um, our next speaker and colleague of mine, Eric Mysona. Uh, Eric will be presenting on the chlorinated ethene plume behavior after source area remediation. So take it away, Eric. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, in the next slide here, I'm going to be talking about the enhanced in situ bioremediation. I'll go back one. Uh, enhanced in situ bioremediation of uh, PCE in a source area and its effects uh, on a plume downgrading of the site. Okay, go ahead. And I'll be talking about the enhanced in situ bioremediation pilot test uh, that have ramped up to full scale uh, implementation and then it, look at the uh, down gradient plume effects and also uh, look at the monitored natural attenuation that's ongoing. Uh, before, oh, go, go back. Before I do that, I'd like to uh, give special thanks to the technical director, uh, Glenn Ulrich, and the lead technician, Jim Shaw, who designed and built everything you see here and inside the shed and, and the guts of, and, and actually implemented the work, and also drew, senior geologist Drew, drew McGowan who did a lot, a lot of the investigation work and also helped with the remediation. Uh, you can see a couple of the way mixed tanks here, and then we also had some totes of emulsified vegetable oil uh, on the left there. You can see that's, that's our system there. Uh, next. Uh, this is a site. It's a, an industrial laundry facility located in southwest Ohio. It's, uh, there are various non-point source releases of tetrachloroethene or PCE, a chlorinated solvent, uh, between 1969 and 1985. And just keep, keep in mind that that was the only solvent that they used there and that was re released at the site. So only PCE was released. Um, in 1985, there was a, a, a a release from an above ground storage tank, a thousand gallon tank, not the entire volume, but a substantial notable release. Um, in the source area, the facility source area, if you look in the middle of the red cloud there in the middle of the site, just west of the building, that's where that uh, release was. Um, all the surface water from the building to the west drains into the infiltration ponds, and there's no storm sewers in this general area. I'll talk about that in a moment, but all the surface water drained into the infiltration ponds in the northwest corner of the site, and that ended up being a secondary uh, source area. Uh, for about 10 years afterwards, uh, other consultants did some groundwater recovery, uh, soil vapor extraction and monitoring. Uh, Parsons started some uh, air sparge and soil vapor extraction in 1997 to the 99 and, and did knock down concentrations in about half in a, in a facility in pond source areas. And from 1999 to 2006, we did some propane injection coupled with the SVE. It was pretty simple to retrofit the air sparge system and just add propane, use it propane instead of air to really start some bioremediation efforts then. And that did knock down concentrations in our limited treatment area about an order of magnitude. Uh, we did some additional site characterizations. It's a complex site, and you really want to know where you're going to deliver your product. So we, we did that for a couple of years in, in, in compliance also with some director's orders. And we did, um, in 2012, we ended up doing a way pilot test in, within that, uh, the west side of the facility source area and in, in, within the, the red area. And between 2014 and 18, we implemented full-scale in, in enhanced in situ bioremediation uh, in the facility source area and also in the ponds. Next. This is a cross-section uh, underneath the building to the west, basically showing the facility source area. Uh, the area is in a uh, Berry Valley aquifer, uh, mostly sand, gravel, cobbles. You have very coarse material. Uh, but there are some low permeability zones of silt and clay, you know, straddling the water table, and also there's a, a thicker 
a low permeability zone. The top of it is about 45 to 60 feet below grade. It's about 10 to 20 feet thick. Fairly continuous. There are some gaps in it uh, further west as well. Uh, very high hydraulic conductivity, um, and the groundwater velocity is, you know, range is, is typically about a foot per day, uh, up to three feet per day when there was pumping uh, at the site. But in general, the, the hydraulic gradient is fairly flat. Now, the regional aquifer is mostly aerobic. Uh, there are marginally reducing uh, conditions in the source area, um, and especially in the fine zones, and also in other isolated areas. Keeping in mind this is an industrial area, there are fuel storage terminals with releases, up gradient and cross gradient up here as well. And the, uh, the, the there's low dissolved oxygen in the deep confined aquifer below below that uh, low permeability zone, uh, and there was really no PCE detected in that zone, fortunately, and so that was an effective barrier. And it also that that deep for aquifer act is we use that for our makeup water for our injection. So we had low dissolved oxygen, you know, low DO in there, and also no PCE. So that was a good source of makeup water. Um, we started the pilot test in the red box in the middle of the figure. That was the isolated pilot test zone, and then we expanded to the, the green area uh, during full scale and extended uh, injections underneath the building, and also did a, uh, a down gradient tre treatment zone as well, as you see in that box on the left. Okay, next. In January 2012, we did uh, an enhanced in situ bioremediation pilot test where we injected. Uh, we had two sets of three wells. We injected whey, sodium lactate, sodium sulfate, and the halococoides uh, pushed with uh, argon. Uh, we did not want to expose these, these microbes to uh, oxygen. And we also used the, that low dissolved oxygen or low DO makeup water that I was talking about. And so we, we noticed uh, biodegradation to ethene within six weeks. You can see the biodegradation pathway of PC on the right. Uh, focusing on the top pie charts, so that's baseline conditions uh, before our injection. And then in the, the pie chart on the bottom is, is post injection, 30 days after, about 30 days after injection. You can see the PCE was dark blue, that's predominant in the top in baseline. And then in the, in the post injection, it was predominantly degradation products such as DCE and green. Um, and then ethene, which is an innocuous degradation product at the, at the bottom end there, with no chlor chlorides, and uh, that's light blue. So we, we converted most of the PCE to either ethene or DCE within you know, basically 30 days or so after injection. Um, with, with the, and these are all within the injection uh, wells themselves. There's a, a former air sparge well to the west. You can see the, the one AS1-2, the, the blue circle to the left in the west. That basically had mostly ethene and a little bit of vinyl chloride. We did a, do a baseline sample there, but you can see even outside of our injection wells, we had a, a, a very positive effect of biodegradation and include basically uh, match, uh, dechlorination all the way to ethene. Okay, go ahead, next. So the bottom right figure shows uh, basically where, where this uh, there, we did a tracer test. We injected a rhodamine tracer in the west three wells, and that's shown in red. And in the east three wells, we injected fluorescine along with the substrates. Um, it, the groundwater was a little bit to the, mainly to the west at first, but then it shifted to the northwest. There are some high water levels um, that caused that westward flow temporarily. But in general, if you look at the bit larger figure on the left, you can see that tracer and, and the total organic carbon, the TOC shown by the black line, it pretty much distributed um, it within nine months, went over 200 feet down gradient in, that one, in nine months. And also um, the PCE concentrations decreased within that same footprint for the most part to uh, less than five parts per billion uh, after nine months. And next. Now after seeing that the successful pilot test results, uh, we wanted to really say, look at long-term uh, life cycle savings, cost savings. So we were at the time required by the state to pump 200 gallons a minute or so of, of groundwater and uh, basically dump it to the sanitary discharge because there were no storm sewers nearby. And so that was a, a very high cost to do that. The discharge alone was you know, about $130,000 a year. 
and there's a lot of iron dissolved iron in the groundwater. And as you can see from the, the pump there, and, and you can imagine the well screens required frequent maintenance for fouling due to iron. Um, so our goal is to shut down this system as quickly as possible because we're pretty much pumping money down the drain. So we ramped up to full scale, as you'll see in the next couple of you know, slides, but don't go there yet. Um, so we were able to shut down groundwater pumping at the end of 2014, and um, the total EIS bead injection costs ended up being about $1.8 million. Um, and that essentially the break-even point would have been 12 years, but fortunately there was a matching funds from the uh, – there's a basically a municipal well field board there that has matching fund grant funds. So the client basically would see a return on investment about seven years after uh, the full-scale injection started. And so in about 20 years, there would be over a million-dollar savings in the O&M costs alone. Okay, next. So this shows – uh, the larger plume you see there is baseline conditions late 2013, early 2014 before we did any injections. Now, when we ramped up to full scale, we injected a, a mixture of whey, uh, emulsified vegetable oil, or EVO, and the Dehalo cocoides culture, the DHC. DHC. And uh, there were six injections between 2014 and 18 in uh, the facility source area, and then there were three injections in the pond area, which was a little bit less impacted. Uh, we did three injections in, in two years, 2014 and 15. So you can see the difference between, oh, go back. You can see the difference between the overall large plume with concentrations that were over 1,000 parts per billion um, in some places underneath the building um, to, and it covered a large area to the small footprint of, in November 2019, you see the small purple hatching. Uh, that's the plume, PC plume, in 2000, November 2019. And the highest concentration in 2019 right now on site is 15 parts per billion. So we, we decreased concentrations several orders of magnitude, and, and the majority of the site is now less than, than the MCL of 5 of micrograms per liter. Okay, next. This is a total organic carbon distribution in green. You can see compared to the, the historic footprint of PCE in blue, uh, this is a snapshot from 2019 showing the, the, the November 2019 PCE plume is that small little uh, kidney-shaped purple hatching area. And you can see that we successfully delivered carbon to most of the on-site plume, and it also the carbon uh, extended off-site. Um, we did have isolated zones with marginal carbon delivery. If you look at the existing uh, November 2019 plume, the purple hatched area, uh, that's, that's essentially a couple of those areas where there's no uh, carbon or no carbon above back background. So for whatever reason, mainly due to preferential flow paths, we couldn't deliver carbon to everywhere, but it's certainly surrounded by carbon. Uh, so that's probably why we have the, the residual PC concentrations there, so just mainly because of preferential flow paths. And uh, and there is elevated TOC, 1,000 feet down gradient, and we even see some TOC as far as 2,500 feet down gradient of the injection wells. Okay, next. This is a graph from uh, of the well, a monitoring well in under the building, facility building, where you didn't start injecting there until 2017. Um, and you can see there was some natural attenuation prior to injection. The PCE, the only thing that was released at the site is in blue, and then its degradation products are TCE and DCE is in red and green, green respectively. Uh, that, that those were there before we did any injections underneath the building or anywhere that would have affected that well. And then after our injection, you could see the, the black line, the black dashed line is total organic carbon. That spiked up, and PCE and TC dropped below one part per billion. Um, we just temporarily uh, generate a little bit of ECE, but that draw also dropped. And then now the highest uh, concentration of anything is, is the, the final degradation product of ethene underneath the building right now. So that shows complete dechlorination from PCE to ethene. Uh, really within three months it's, it, it started and happened, and there's been no PC or TC rebound since, and that's been over a year since our last injection. Uh, next. This shows the total CVOC changes on site. Uh, the green circles show um, greater than 50% total chlorinated volatile organic compound reductions near the injection areas. 
Uh, and then it's mostly decreasing total CVOCs, immediately downgrading as well. There are a couple places, the blue circles you could see, we only had a zero to 50% reduction. And isolated areas along the fringe of the plume, in a couple areas, there will appear to be some total CVOC increases, but those are mostly uh, due to uh, higher proportions of, of the degradation products, DCE, DCE, and a little bit of vinyl chloride. Okay, next. This is a snapshot from November 2019. You can see, you can see within the red box, there's a small little yellow plume on the site, and that's the scale of the site plume, residual site plume, to compare to the entire off-site plume. Um, and so the residual plume only has five to 15 parts per billion on site in a very isolated area. Uh, PCE is below MCLs up to 400 feet down gradient of the injection wells and is previously, you know, up to 500 parts per billion at that, at those wells. Uh, we have decreasing PCE concentrations up to 1,000 feet down gradient of the injection wells and that's sort of in the blue area that the plume right now and uh, which is over 100 parts per billion currently. Um, and the leading edge of the plume is stable to declining. And we'll talk about show that in the next slide. Uh, this is downgrading of the property line, uh, 70 feet down gradient. This shows more successful dechlorination of PCE, maybe not as quick, but there is a little bit of a lag time for groundwater flow to get there with the carbon. Uh, and this is similar to what we saw where you had some natural attenuation of you know, degradation products prior to injection. Um, and then we have primarily uh, degradation products, ethene and DCE, after the carbon got there. Okay, go ahead. Next slide. The uh, total CVOC is downgrading. You can see the green circles, once again, greater than 50% reduction, the blue, 0 to 50%. And so we did have uh, reductions of total CVOCs on the site and, and up to 1,000 feet down gradient. And once you get to the, uh, the distal end of the plume, about 2,500 feet down gradient, you see the orange, which shows an apparent increase. But those, that's mostly uh, DCE, the degradation product, dichloroethene. And so, and, and I'll show in a couple slides later, the overall plume is stable to declining, and we do, and that is evidence of natural attenuation along the leading edge of the plume. Okay, next. We also saw some methane, dissolved methane in the groundwater at different places along, you know, three to 400 feet down gradient as the top set of graphs. Uh, 80, 850 to 1,100 feet is, is the middle set of graphs, and then 2,500 to 3,000 feet is the bottom set of graphs. You can see that there was a pretty quick response to methane closer to injection areas, and there was a lag time and a lower magnitude of, of dissolved methane, of course, further down gradient. But we did see increased methane up to 2,500 feet down gradient from the injection wells as a result of the enhanced tissue bioremediation uh, on site. Okay, next. And so no CVOCs uh, are above the MCLs at the century well. You can see at the upper graph, on the, on the very right-hand graph, that's the most distant century well. And there was uh, more degradation products, proportionally speaking, at the leading edge of the plume. That's the green is DCE, and there's, there's no PC or TC there. So as you go down the flow path, there's more degradation products, which is evidence of natural attenuation. And you look at the lower left graph, and that shows there's four different wells which shows the total coordinates are uh, stable to declining for the past 10 years. And so we're going to continue our semi-annual sampling and do some additional uh, natural attenuation sampling and consider uh, compound-specific isotope sampling in the future. There's another line of evidence for na monitored not natural attenuation. Okay, next slide. And in conclusion, our full-scale EISB effectively treated the source areas with minimal rebound. Uh, the PCE and the total CVOCs are decreasing along the flow path. Uh, we do have evidence of natural attenuation at the leading edge of the plume. The, the remedy going forward is uh, monitored natural attenuation, and we're continuing the SV under the building to make sure there's no methane that builds up and also to keep the chlorinated from potentially migrating to indoor air. And we would only consider additional injections as a uh, contingency. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for the time, and, and while, while you ask questions here, um, you can enjoy the shed that we, uh, Jim Shaw built and designed, and you can see nine different wells we can inject simultaneously and add and dose in our, our substrate and uh, argon to push the, uh, the halo cocoides.
I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. We do have one question on the WebEx. It says, with the ever-evolving variation in biological species, how quickly can we develop sensors? I'm sorry, could you repeat actually, that question? That was actually a question for the first presentation. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I thought they were talking about the Halo Cocoides or whatever microbes they were talking yeah. about. And there's no more um, I think, um, no more questions. Okay, if there's no more questions, I think it's time for the next speaker. Um, uh, Yoav Rapport will uh, be talking about the use of mobile form technology and data analytics dashboards for uh, investigation and remediation product, projects. Um, Yoav? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll be talking about the use of mobile forms for analytical, uh, for investigations and remediation. We'll display that data using analytical dashboards and the form data collection processes that we're using. Uh, talk a little bit about our data management, digital data management philosophy, and what the past looked like, and what the, uh, the current state of affairs is and how we're deploying those resources, and then we'll look at the agile development environment that we've uh, constructed, get look at some examples, and uh, hopefully uh, discuss, have some time to discuss uh, return on investment. Really in the, uh, in, the, in the past, I think we've used a lot of paper Excel spreadsheets, and now we're finding that the need for uh, safety and security and uh, rapid data management between uh, systems is necessary. And we're also looking to gain more than we've had before. So we're able to replace what we were doing, well, that's fine, but we can do more with it because the devices that we're carrying with us can do more. They can take the photos, you can mark up the photos, and when you submit the information, it can create instant alerts and warnings to uh, give you heads up that uh, your data or your, your observations uh, need attention. We can also dispatch and create assignments and, of course, collect location information uh, and monitor, that, monitor the data collection uh, from afar, as well as print the labels for our collection efforts. We're seeing these what we've seen really over the last uh, seven, ten years is that in the marketplace there's a lot of different solutions um, by uh, really sometimes spread against the mark, you know, uh, in, in, in a certain market, ver market vertical. And uh, throughout the uh, Parsons environment in the environmental, we're seeing these types of projects coming up more and more and we weren't able to fit our solutions into uh, commercial products. And then they certainly are there, and we do use commercial products. But we're seeing more and more in the area of inventory and collection, dispatching of tickets to address um, uh, operations and maintenance, and uh, for closeout of inspection facilities for construction, and also for utility mapping, supporting uh, systems that are then going to be used for modeling. Uh, generally, uh, often people ask for uh, guidance on select selecting um, their devices. You're going to need a device, and you're going to need a device that is, addresses your need. So uh, if you're working on top of, uh, top of the bridge, you're going to need a device that can handle the glare, can be tethered to you, and is tough. Or if you're working in an in industrial environment, then you're going to need uh, devices that can handle the caustic environment, the heat, and the cold. And also at the same time, we are looking at the software that's running on these devices. Uh, at Parsons, we've created our own uh, software for particular purposes. We use forms on fire. We've looked at this sort of a list on the, uh, on the left side. And increasingly, we're using more and more the ESRI-based, GIS-based forms or, collect, or creating our own. So these are collector 
and survey one, two, three. And these are configured uh, apps that integrate with our current databases that we're building and putting together. So what we're looking for is uh, an agile application development environment because what we found is that we have a, a set of, of databases that we need to populate and we need to reach, we need to get these databases populated so we can produce reports. So this is our general uh, setup and how we're trying to connect all our uh, databases together. We are using a SQL server, uh, sometimes with an access front end or we'll build an ASP.NET front end to it for data entry. We might enter the information in SharePoint list and form and we produce reports from these servers that can be automated delivered on a timed or on an exception report if something comes up. The SQL server and the GIS servers are sitting in the same place so they can uh, talk to each other and communicate. And also we're accepting information from external um, databases, the laboratory analytical databases. I'm going to focus on two areas, on area one, which is the mobile application development, and area two is the uh, use of our Power BI dashboards for this, for these purposes. Uh, here's uh, an example of a, of a form. The, uh, the data is, is made up, so this is not data from anybody particular house or our client data at all. But it's, uh, it's an example of how on the left we're collecting information, but we're keeping the safety of our field crews in mind. So if they've observed uh, an exception or a hazard situation such as a dog or unsafe road conditions or unsafe, any, any kind of uh, safety uh, precautions they need to take, then they're marking that down. And then on the right side is an example of creating a, uh, a field form through going through a collection and then printing, you know, carrying uh, Bluetooth printers with us. Uh, taking that label so you can label the, bo the, um, the bottle right there in the field so that when it gets sent to the lab, it, uh, it's, um, it's easy to read and we have less transcription errors because that's what one thing we were seeing from the, CO from the COC forms, which also get created uh, digitally, but we were seeing some transcription errors and having to fix that later. And as I mentioned, that uh, the, uh, these forms, which we we have looked at, we have looked at, um, have looked at the, uh, the forms on Fire Platform, is that it allows us to give the flexibility of sending the information simultaneously to several data stores. So we're, we're sending it to the SQL, uh, potentially some SharePoint lists, and a, uh, a snapshot of that collection to uh, a SharePoint library, and then, uh, and then from there we can take it to other libraries or create, um, create reports out of that, and to the dashboards, of course, or feeding, feeding them through a, uh, a QC process. So generally what, we, what we've done is we've done data collection in the field, and then we're uh, pushing it through a quality control system. So here's an example of how this works. I picked this one here because it has that same uh, warning here of the aggressive dog. And these forms, uh, you've probably seen them before, but these forms are, uh, are being di are dynamic, so, and they have uh, a lot of logic consistency. And that's the reason why we're taking this development approach because it allows us to have that kind of flexibility. So, when we, when we make a selection here, uh, I, won't, I won't go through the full, full, full form, we can collect the GPS point, it knows what it is, and we are using the logic for our field crews with, uh, with hints and text and exceptions and forcing them to, uh, to, collect, um, you know, to collect certain types of information. So this is a well, um, well collection form. So that information is get, uh, gets uh, sent up to, uh, to the database. And so, for example, um, once it gets submitted, a, a GIS process is run in the background. 
here's the, here's the GIS. This is the data status that's been collected on, uh, on the web form. And I've just taken uh, a Fort Walton Beach as an example. So here's the hazard information. I think it was one of these properties here. You can show the field crews. The field crews are also walking with uh, their GIS collector. So the very next day before they make a, a visit, they are aware of the hazard before they even approach. They can uh, possibly make a phone call to the, uh, the client and make sure the dog is put away, uh, something like that. Okay. So in terms of the analytical dashboards, uh, that data gets pushed up to the SQL Server and the SQL Server and the, the Power BI, you know, there's a lot of Microsoft um, use of uh, software here. The Power BI picks up the data and really takes a subject matter expert to design these forms to understand uh, what it is, what decisions they're making, and how they're uh, managing their day-to-day -day work. But these uh, visuals, uh, it puts it into the hands of uh, the operators. We are merely creating the data model for them to allow them to do reporting on their own. The, 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 the dashboard data model is very similar to the SQL data model, and it basically uh, matches it one for one, maybe with a couple of other additional um, tools that are being created, and it allows you to uh, to see that data um, on a refresh scale. And we would generally are doing daily refresh. And that's what these projects need, but uh, they can be automated to refresh um, several times a day. Um, the other features are that they are connected to our corporate or enterprise GIS. So um, information that is that we're updating in the GIS is being displayed on the dashboards and allows our users who are become better and better at it to create their own dashboard. So the data is open to them, the data model is open to them to recreate their own investigation. I often see people who use the dashboards to see, to, to do data cleansing. So they're really looking at that data to figure out if um, there are any exceptions because it's much easier to see it kind of an Excel spreadsheet, um, but uh, with quicker form, uh, quicker filters and reporting. Um, this is again that, that similar dashboard. It allows you to set up all your kind of filters to see, to see, and then here the, the GIS is available. So you can see the you can see the layers that are being hosted and fed from the that same GIS server with uh, people who have the credentials. And I think there's been a lot of great strides in in the uh, connection between these systems. And this is not a this this is more to show a system that's flexible. And it's, uh, it's got a little bit less rigidity only because the development environment needs to be uh, spun up a little bit quicker. So again, this is that same, same view, that same, you know, where, where, is, where is the hazard and things like that. You can see some of the more detail. You can create like, more detail for specific uh, sample results and, and things like that. We've seen very elaborate analytical dashboards uh, created by uh, subject matter experts that truly understand the, uh, the data model and what uh, problems they're trying to solve. So clearly you have your cost of uh, hardware and software subscriptions. Uh, we, at Parsons, we don't make any uh, um, additional income or on the software subscription, it's just a pass-through, it's about $25 a month per person. So 
for that form on fire solution. So it's not always the best solution if you have very large groups of people. If you have hundreds of people, then the form solution is probably going to be something a little bit different uh, because you want to avoid those high subscription costs. But it it, uh, it comes with the benefit of the form design uh, flexibility. And of course, that form design, that that's where the human capital comes in, you know, building experiences, building uh, some of the features, getting around features that are not out of the box, such as the photo management per se, or alert systems that get created on the SQL backend, for example, or on the GIS where you need to parse the GIS data. Uh, I'm sorry, you need to parse the tabular data into the GIS and vice versa. But hopefully, you're picking up that. In, uh, well, we we found that we're picking up the savings on the transcription time, on the or error avoidance and the speed and agility of, of being able to collect digital forms. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, project examples here. I mean, it's quite generic, so I can't get into specific clients, but we've realized, uh, you know, we're kind of comparing it, I guess, on the return investment on the paper. Now, at this point, it's no longer fair, a fair comparison because I don't know if anybody's using paper too much, but um, certainly the enhanced features of alerting and or error avoidance uh, are a little bit harder to uh, determine their cost. But in terms of safety, uh, we, we believe in the safety of our um, clients and our field crews. And we certainly have all had incidents and we review the incidents and some of these tools have come because of our in-depth uh, review of something that happened, whether it's a safety checklist that we're doing or the, the dog avoidance. I mean, I know a client that sent the, um, the field crews for dog safety training, you know, to, to learn how to deal with dogs. So we're taking it quite seriously. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank the team uh, on the left here that's helped in development of, of these tools. And uh, some of the takeaway is that we've learned is that the data may grow rather quickly. I'm looking at the kind of a down, downgrade here. It tends to grow quicker than um, we uh, initially, um, ex initially expect. So because we have the ability to put things into a SQL database or other cloud storage, we prefer to put that up front. It generally takes, has a little bit of a higher cost to us, uh, but if we anticipate that the project and the data needs and, and flexibility is going to be required, go, you know, go with the, uh, the more versatile tool sooner is what we've learned. And we never want to really forget about the, the uh, COT solution because uh, they may have integration touch points that we need to feed into, but they also uh, provide such an analytical um, licenses. They also provide that rigidity that uh, a project is, that's lasting for years is going to require. And so the flexible softwares have a place maybe at the beginning of a project as you get further and further into monitoring that data, you want to uh, look into solutions that are that uh, can be sustained for many, many years and provide the rigidity for reporting purposes that you need. Uh, I guess we have time for questions. Thank you, everyone. If you do wish to ask a question on the WebEx, just click into the black circle with the white dots on your screen, type your question, and send to all panelists. And there is one from William Chen. It says, regarding subscription costs associated with software forms, can these tools be built on software that is already deployed to all employees, i.e. Microsoft Flows or Microsoft Forms? Yeah, we've, we've looked at um, Microsoft uh, Power Automate, Microsoft uh, Power Automate Forms, and we do deploy them uh, when it's needed. So those are available. 
they have a little bit of harder development environment in terms of the uh, colorization, the design, the um, well, logic, logic ability, but I mean, everything, you know, it's possible we just found a rapid development of um, a couple of particular software platform it's quite efficient for us. So we uh, felt for, for small, as I mentioned, for smaller groups, we saw uh, cost benefit to doing, to using those, but I think where some forms are much simpler and you need for a large uh, environment like a, uh, well, let's say an engineering department of a, of a, you know, transportation department where they need to make observations from the field. Uh, a lot of departments have GIS, so they might be able to use collector or they can use um, power, power automate. Uh, power, you know, the, the Microsoft uh, given forms. So yes, you have to do the cost uh, benefit analysis. And I think it really depends on the number of users and the flexibility uh, that you need in the uh, form platform. Okay, I see another question. Oh. Right, can I, how do yes, we go about that? Go ahead. Sorry, it says, have you run into issues with the uh, one gigabyte data limitation in Power B1? No, I ha we haven't come across that for the data that we use. I think we are at about half a, half a million records, so that's something we'd have to look at if we get above that. And the further one, how do we go about accessing Power B1 software if we are interested in playing with this software? Okay, uh, from a corporate perspective, uh, I think there's demonstration software for the general, you know, general population. Uh, at Parsons, as a corporation, we have uh, a bucket, from what I understand, of uh, Power BI Pro, and we have an asset software asset manager, which uh, basically uh, provides that software, the Power BI Pro. And it, it works both on a desktop or on a web. Basically, get, it publishes it to a web uh, website on SharePoint. Thank you, and we have no further questions. Okay, next up uh, is uh, a colleague of mine, Glenn Early, who will discuss uh, a mulching operation on Long Island where they found some interesting uh, solutions. Glenn, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. You have, you can go ahead and proceed to the next slide, please. So, uh, again, thanks for, to everyone for joining us today. That This is our, our last presentation. Uh, the title of this presentation is The Influence of Mulching Operations on Long Island Groundwater Mechanisms and Mitigation. Okay. Before I get into any, any details, I wanted to thank my um, collaborators here from Parsons, also from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, as well as Ramble. This was a, a team effort. Okay. So this was an important project uh, for the state of New York, specifically Long Island. Uh, before this project, uh, the state, as well as a local health department, noted impacted groundwater at several residences. They noted that these uh, residences were located in the vicinity and generally down gradient of what is termed vegetative organic waste processing facilities. That includes both mulching operations as well as compost facilities. So we were hired to, uh, with the ultimate goal in mind of developing practices uh, at these facilities that would limit uh, impacts to groundwater. However, before we could do that, we really needed to understand the mechanisms by which these piles, as you can see an example here, uh, these are windrows of mulch um, uh, how are these piles impacting groundwater? 
So we can't fix that problem. We can't develop better practices unless we know the mechanism. So there's really this presentation I'm going to focus on a few things, one of which is the mechanisms responsible, and then I'm going to transition to, you know, based on what we learned, we'll transition to uh, a pilot test where we uh, evaluated um, uh, practices that could limit impacts to groundwater. All righty. So a little background on how mulch, mulch is processed in uh, Long Island. First, uh, you have trees, uh, large trees. You have uh, limbs, et cetera, uh, th where that material is staged. The material is passed through a grinder, um, and that results in a coarse ground material. Uh, there's a photo of that on the upper left. If you notice on the, the tape there, uh, the diameter of those pieces of wood are, you know, up to an inch wide, if not wider. After that initial grind, the, the mulch, the coarse ground material is placed through a grinder on a second occasion, resulting in a finer ground material. You can see that on the right. And that's, of course, the final cons consistency uh, for mulch. Um, once the material is ground twice, it is placed into piles, generally windrows. You can see an example. Uh, on the bottom photograph there. Some of the issues that the operators have with these, um, at these mulching operations include fires. So obviously biodegradation generates a lot of heat. That heat gets trapped in the piles and it can start uh, result in fires. Another issue is odors. Um, so in some cases these facilities are located uh, close to uh, residences and, and they do get complaints. These operations are regulated by the state of New York uh, and the, the NYSDEC provides guidance. And of course, we were working with the, the NYDEC to, um, you know, for this project to further their, their guidance. Okay. So this is, these are the results uh, from the uh, gr initial groundwater investigation that really led to this project. Again, uh, there were impact, initial impacts to groundwater observed. Uh, that led to uh, collecting samples from roughly 200 temporary well points uh, and uh, evaluating uh, the, the types of constituents uh, that were impacting groundwater. This study was conducted by the state of New York uh, as well as the Suffolk uh, County Health Department. So if we focus on the, the data table here, it's a big table, uh, but it's fairly simple. We have on the, the left impacted groundwater. Uh, again, these are samples located down gradient of these facilities. Uh, we have unimpacted groundwater composition for comparison. And then on the far right, we have an enrichment factor, which is just simply the extent to which these con individual con constituents is enriched relative to unimpacted groundwater. Um, a couple of the constituents that were enriched to the greatest extent include iron, manganese, and potassium. The other thing we noticed uh, with these samples is that uh, samples with higher levels of iron and manganese generally had lower levels of dissolved oxygen, and I'll come back to that in a moment. If you could advance the slide, please. Now we're looking at, again, uh, additional results or another display of these results, um, and we're going to focus on the upper three charts. This is the manganese concentration. Uh, with depth, depth ranges from on the y-axis there from zero to 100, 100 feet. As you can see, there's groundwater very shallow um, uh, in, in Long Island. And the, the black uh, lines there indicate manganese concentrations in non-impacted groundwater. And then the red lines indicate manganese concentrations for impacted water, those samples again being located down gradient of these facilities. The bottom line is what we can see here is significant increase in manganese concentration uh, extending. The, the upper left plot is from samples collected from between zero to 500 feet down gradient of these facilities. Um, the graph on the far right, upper far right, uh, are samples from up to 1,000 feet, if not greater, or, or actually greater than 1,000 feet from the the piles or, the, or these facilities, and we can see again significant manganese. Very similar results for iron on the bottom. So we have enriched iron and manganese concentrations migrating greater than 1,000 feet from these facilities. And, okay. 
So we'll now transition from groundwater to really getting at the root of the cause and what's causing, what are some of the mechanisms behind these impacts uh, to Long Island groundwater. And, and I should have said from the, from the outset that obviously uh, groundwater is a very precious resource on an island with millions of people where the only source of, of drinking water is, is groundwater. So this is an important process. It's an important question for the state of New York to solve. So this, this uh, figure here or the map is just showing a couple facilities, uh, again, where we uh, investigated kind of getting at the mechanism of these piles, really studying the piles themselves and what's happening, and then it eventually led to the pilot study that we'll also talk about. So next slide. Conceptually, um, we had an hypothesis uh, going into this project that, was, that most people would probably think of, and that is as it rains and as you have snow melt on the top of these mulch piles, the precipitation is going to infiltrate. It's going to infiltrate through the entire thickness of the piles, and it's going to eventually move into the Vado zone and ultimately uh, to groundwater below the piles. That largely uh, appears to not be the case. Some results that indicate that, uh, we'll start on the, the graph on the left. This is a plot of moisture levels in the pile on the right, beginning from one, one uh, foot into the pile, extending down five feet into, into that mulch pile. And what you can see is on three occasions, the same general trend is shown and that is that we have a lower and lower moisture content of the mulch moving into the pile. That would, of course, suggest that the precipitation was not migrating through the entire pile. A um, couple things that are going on here, we did uh, show that on several occasions um, in, in several piles. A couple contributing factors. First, notice the slope of the pile. So as it rains or as snow melts, the slope of the pile is going to tend to uh, promote the migration of precipitation and leachate along the side of the pile. Secondly, generally the mulch piles are, ground, are finely ground, so there's two grinds, and so the material is going to absorb a lot of moisture. Um, thirdly, um, given that we have significant biodegradation, We've probably all seen this, especially those that, of you that garden. If you dig into a mulch pile, you see a lot of steam. We observe the steam as well uh, during the winter, but it's always happening. You always have heat being generated in these piles. You have gases such as uh, CO2 pred predominantly, in some cases methane being generated and other gases. Um, and those gases and heat are carrying moisture out of the, out of the piles. So it's, it's much more complicated. There's a lot going on in these piles, but clearly understanding the distribution of moisture, moisture uh, in these piles was important, okay? Move on to the pilot study. So again, the ultimate objective here is to find uh, alternative approaches, uh, ideally low cost, that the operators could use to mitigate and minimize uh, impacts to Long Island groundwater. So we conducted a pilot test to try a few things. Uh, that includes simply lining the pile. That would be the upper right-hand pile. So you can probably, if you look close enough, see a liner. Um, and the idea there is, of course, to collect a leachate. And we did that. Uh, one of the potential issues from an operator's perspective is, well, if I'm collecting a leachate, I'm probably going to have to treat it. That led to the idea that we will simply cover uh, a mulch pile. And we did that. Uh, with a breathable fleece material. Um, essentially what that material or cover does is it prevents precipitation from, from um, infiltrating. It simply migrates off the top of the, of the fleece. But this is important. It, the, the claim was that this fleece material will allow gases and heat to escape. And that's, of course, very important uh, because we didn't want to, you know, heat up the pile and cause an increased risk for fires. Um, Pile two here, moving down the, the, the figure to, to the southwest. Pile two was the concept that if we grind this material to a coarser extent, so let's not grind it very fine, let's keep it at a, at a more coarse uh, material, 
and that would potentially limit the amount of leaching just simply because you have less surface area uh, of, or contact between the infiltrating water uh, and the mulch itself. And then the final pile was a control operated in a fashion that was very uh, similar to the way uh, a typical mulch pile would be operated. Okay. Photo on the left is the, the, the line pile that's being constructed. Okay, it's, it's not finished by any means. Eventually these piles were approximately 10 feet tall. And then on the right, um, you can see the covered pile. Very simply, you can see the blocks uh, holding that, that uh, fleece down. So very simple approach, which is good. Okay, next slide. So again, moisture is important. Understanding moisture dynamics in mulch piles ends up being a very important thing uh, for understanding what's going on. Um, and that's demonstrated again in this figure. So um, again, these are moisture, moisture levels with depth in our four pilot piles. Uh, you're seeing a lot of data uh, on these slides, only a few points, but it's uh, an average of several um, uh, moisture uh, level readings uh, throughout the piles. Um, starting with the two graphs on the, or the two lines on the far right, both of those are from the fine, finely ground, uncovered mulch piles. So again, that's typical for your Long Island mulching operations. And again, what you can see is that uh, profile very similar to the, to the one that we showed you from the, or that I just mentioned uh, from uh, one of the mulching facilities where you, know, you have a higher moisture near the surface or the, the top, in this case one foot uh, below the surface of the, of the, of the pile and a decreasing trend in moisture moving vertically into the pile down to five feet. Now again, we could, our moisture probe was only five feet long. We could not uh, gather moisture contents through the entire pile. But again, we do see this decreasing trend, uh, again, in the finely ground mulch. Interestingly, um, throughout the pilot, we were able to collect uh, uh, leachate below those finely ground mulch piles on only one occasion, so one on one of six occasions. In contrast, the coarsely ground material, uh, which is shown in orange, you can see a more consistent vertical trend in the moisture levels. And in every case that we attempted to collect leachate under those coarsely ground mulch piles, we were able to do so. So essentially, the moisture is getting hung up in the finely ground mulch piles. It's not migrating through. Uh, the, the entire thickness of the piles. Um, the other point here is the, the, the covering or with the fine fleece material, you can see that the moisture level there is very low. That's the data on the far left. So where we covered the mulch with the, the breathable fleece, it dried out, um, which is indicating again that the, that the cover worked. It didn't allow precipitation to move in. And, it, and importantly, it also allowed uh, gases uh, in moisture to migrate out of that uh, mulch pile, the covered mulch pile. Next slide, please. We also monitored temperature uh, over time. We monitored a lot of things uh, in these piles. Um, I'm just going to show temperature as an example. Uh, again, temperature is important because if the temperature increases uh, too much in these piles, you can't have uh, fire issues. Um, beginning uh, here, you can see the temperature starting around 80 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, then you can see the temperature decreasing as winter advances and it gets colder. Spring rolls around, temperature starts to come up, and you can see the temperature of the piles increases to approximately 135 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. The take-home message here in terms of temperature is that there is no difference in uh, temperature behavior in these piles, uh, covering the piles, lining them, and the size or the, the coarseness of the material had no influence on the temperature. Um, importantly, the fleece uh, did not, or covering the, pyre, the, the pile with that fleece material uh, or liner did not result in higher temperature. Okay? Moving along here, so when it comes, back, it comes to mechanisms where we were able to collect leachate below the piles, it, we, we detected fairly low concentrations of iron and manganese, too low of a concentration for the, the direct leaching of these metals, in this case iron and manganese, to be a direct source, a significant source to groundwater. However, we detected high concentrations of biodegradable dissolved organic carbon up to about 2,000 milligrams per liter. Uh, based on those concentrations and just simply the stoichiometry 
for the biodegradation of, of organic carbon under iron and manganese reducing conditions. That's enough DOC to, uh, to cause an issue if it were to uh, migrate into groundwater. Okay, next slide, please. So the sources, mechanisms include mainly that it appears that the organic carbon leaching from these, these piles is, is generating anaerobic conditions. Um, those anaerobic conditions are causing biogeochemical changes, mainly with the reductive dissolution of iron and manganese minerals, uh, leading to increased iron and manganese concentrations in groundwater. And as we um, learned, uh, those influences are observed minimally 1,000 feet down gradient of these facilities. Uh, based on the work we've done, we don't think that the direct leaching of iron and manganese is a substantial contributor uh, to, to impacts to groundwater. Um, we learned importantly that um, in contrast to our initial hypothesis that actually there's very limited precipitation that's migrating through finely ground mulch piles. Uh, rather, uh, we believe uh, based on our work that a more important pathway uh, is precipitation migrating along the sides of the piles and also any water that may accumulate uh, in the vicinity of the piles. So when it comes to best management practices, I'd say there's three things. One, uh, covering your mulch piles with a breathable cover uh, was an effective mitigation, leachate mitiga mitigation approach, at least at the scale that we evaluated, uh, did not result in increased temperatures and essentially water did not, or precipitation did not migrate into those piles. Uh, secondly, again, minimizing ponding and run on around the piles. And, and then um, both of those, by the way, are um, hopefully uh, doable from uh, an operator's perspective. And then finally, we learned that, um, you know, ideally you'd have a significant buffer zone greater than 1,000 feet between these um, mulching facilities as well as compost facilities and any groundwater supply wells uh, in Long Island. And with that, again, thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Just a quick reminder, if you wish to put a, um, a question on the WebEx, please um, click on your screen and it's the black circle with the three white dots. Type your question and send to all panelists. We are just about out of time, so can you uh, advance one more slide here? I wanted to put up, uh, this is contact information for all of our presenters, and if you have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, feel free to contact them directly, or you can respond to the uh, invitation email that you received, and we will get those questions to the subject matter experts and get some answers back to you via uh, email or phone call following the presentation. I um, wanted to thank all of the presenters here and also to a uh, special thanks to Christy Diller, who was the one who put the presentation together and did a lot of the organization here. So thank you to Christy. And then also a reminder that our webinar series uh, continues next week with our um, regularly scheduled webinar, which is by Tim Alte, and he's going to be talking about how you can extract some more value from the data that you've already paid to collect using uh, the leveraging of location intelligence. So you want to make sure you uh, get a chance to attend that. We will uh, make those invitations and send those out in the next few days, and we look forward to seeing everyone uh, next week. With that, we will close down our webinar. Thanks again to all the presenters, and thanks again to everyone who dialed in. We, uh, we trust this was useful for you, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, Scott, and thank you to all your speakers. Well, thank you, everyone. That concludes your conference call for today. You may now disconnect. Thank you for joining, and enjoy the rest of your day.